hit that magic button. <laughs> you know, we're in a brand new series to see how the Lord's Prayer uh, can teach us how to have peace in our lives. And, and look at the way Jesus begun, begins this prayer. This is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And last week we laid a foundation. You have to completely understand who God is. God is not a force of the universe. He's not a distant, uncaring, unconcerned being. He's not a malicious God who wants to strike you all the time with lightning bolts. He's your father. A father so close that he actually wants you to call him daddy. Now today we're going to look at the very next phrase. Hallowed be thy name. And I get two questions automatically. Like number one, what's the name got to do with it? What's, what's that mean? And, and then number two, what in the world does hallowed mean? <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking Halloween. And I remember when I went to Gettysburg, they called it the hallow ground of battle. What does it mean to be hallowed? Well, I want to answer the second question first. To hallow simply means to make holy. It means to set it apart as special. It means to give it honor. The TE version helps a little bit here, if you would read that version. It says, Our Father in heaven, may your holy name be honored. Now, names are important. Names have always been important to us. And back in the old days, names used to tell a lot about you. Because if somebody was named Carpenter, well, they were the carpenter in the town. If somebody's last name was Smith, they were the Smith in town. And a guy whose last name was Miller, he was the Miller in town. And somebody called Jackson would be Jack's son. Because back then... Names indicated who you were and, and what you did. Now, when you come to God, names are even far more important because God's name indicates who God is and what he does. In the culture of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, names represented character. Names told you what God was and what God did. And so somehow we need to learn to honor the name of God by beginning to understand who he is and what he does. We already know he's Father and loves us. So really notice how this prayer starts out. You know, our Father Abba, Daddy, Papa, may your holy name be honored. Before you ever pray for anything else, Jesus says you need to honor the name of God. Well, how you do that? Well, I think it means we need to do a little further research into the names of God. Now, there are hundreds of names of God in your Bible. In fact, one person estimates that there's 950 names of God in the Bible. I thought about doing all of them, but I considered that you would probably not stay for the remainder of the sermon. So I just want to give you a handful, and I kind of want to show you what they mean and, and what's happening. Three things today. Number one, recognize that God is able to meet my deepest needs. This is something that God's names have always told us. Now, some of these are going to be familiar to you. Some of them are not. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide all my needs. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord's my peace. Jehovah Sikainu, the Lord is my righteousness and are the ways to make me right in his presence. Jehovah Rophe, I'm the Lord that heals. Eloi Serkat, God of forgiveness. El Rakum, the God of compassion. Do you see what all these names of God that I, I picked, do you see what they show? God is our Abba. God's our daddy, I use a papa. And he really is concerned with us. God enjoys meeting the needs of his children. 
Those of you with little kids, or even think back to when they were little, what would you think if you drove home one day and there was your six-year-old and there was your eight-year-old by the road with a sign they wrote in crayon, we'll work for food. <laughs> you say, get back in that house. You're embarrassing me. I'm here to take care of you. I love you and I love to take care of you. You honor God's name when you finally realize that God loves to take care of you. Not everybody believes that. Not everybody lives like that. But God wants to meet all your needs. David said, let your tender hearted mercy quickly meet our needs. And from Philippians, we read this verse. God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Everything we need in life, God will provide. That's a promise. Why? Because he's our father. He loves us. He wants to do that. You know, he's not that nasty, mean guy in the sky. He's a father. Now, the question is, how does knowing that reduce your stress level? Two things. Number one, you don't have to carry it all by yourself. <laughs> I had a church in Tennessee. It was right next to the Appalachian Trail. And so we would always take our youth camping or hiking all the time. We had this kid who weighed about 65 pounds. And he showed up one day with a 40-pound backpack. <laughs> Every time he took a step forward, he would fall back on his butt and backpack. We just laughed our heads off for a long, long time till we finally helped him out, took some of his load. But that's what happens when we try to carry the load of life all by ourselves. One step forward, two steps back. Second thing is you can stop worrying. God has promised to take care of your needs. So think about the biggest need you have in your life. God can meet it. Beyond that, God wants to meet it. So talk to him about it. Why? Because his character depends on it. Because he has his name, his credibility, his reputation, his honor depends on him living up to his name. You believe that? That's the first step to honoring God. Hallowed be your name. Now, the second thing that comes to mind pretty quick with these names of God is God's power. You know, I mean, you've got to realize God has all power, far greater than anything, any of our problems. David says his name is greater than all others. Now, you might know some of these. Elohim, God is strong. He's mighty. He's powerful. He's the God that brought the universe in with the spoken word. Jehovah, or Yahweh. By the way, in your Old Testament, if you have a, a newer version, every once in a while, or actually a lot of times, you'll see Lord in small capital letters, where everything else will be just letters and regular writing. You'll see Lord in all caps. Wherever you see that, this is that name. And in Hebrew, it is the source of all the other names. In all likelihood, this is the exact name of God. Yahweh, as it would be pronounced, Jehovah, Jehovah, as it would later be pronounced in parts of England and places like that. It's just Lord. It comes from the root I am. Moses went to the bush and said, Who do I tell him's coming? He said, I am. I'm here. I am. I mean, that's the ultimate statement. El Shaddai, have you ever heard Amy Grant's song? It means God Almighty. Jehovah Nissi, the God who's my miracle. El Elyon, most high God. El Rahi, the God who sees. And, and one of my favorites, Elohe Tzur. God is my rock like we sang about this morning. Actually, that's one of the favorites. That name occurs more than many, many other names. Uh, from scripture from Samuel there is no one like the Lord there was no one besides you there's no rock like our God 
The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, the rock, my Savior. You know, when life's unfair, God's the rock. When it's unmanageable, God is the rock. When things are falling apart, God is the rock. And when I feel threatened, God is a rock. So what do all these names have in common? Obviously, power. Might, majesty, strength. You have to understand that God is not some weak thing up there who might be listening. God is the ultimate power of the universe. He is holding it together. It's not the laws of physics and quantum mechanics. God is holding the universe together. And the way you hallow the name of God is to realize that, and to live with the realization that he is that powerful. So again, think of the biggest problem you have, and God's bigger. Now, how can that bring you some peace? Well, the good thing is you can stop trying to change the world by yourself. You don't have to. You have a God that will fight your battles and help you. And it also means you can stop worrying about the future. Now, time out. Let's just stop here for a second and look at our prayers. How do we normally pray? We have a list. And we say, God, here's my list. I want you to heal this person. I want you to heal this person. I need you to provide this for me. I need you to provide this for me. And, and I need this, and I need this. Thank you. Amen. Now, how would you feel if your spouse called you at work tomorrow and said, pick up the kids at school, get the oil changed in the car, get some money from the ATM, buy groceries. Thank you, amen. <laughs> you, you would think somebody needs to get some personality lessons. But that's the way we treat God in our prayers every so often. Jesus, on the other hand, says this. When you pray, first of all, start out by calling God your father, your Abba, your daddy and realize that he really, truly is just that close to you. I mean, you have to understand your relationship with the God of all. And then Jesus says, I want you to pray, let your holy name be honored in my life and in this world. So why don't our prayers begin with honoring God? Why can't we take a few minutes just to honor the majesty of God? Well, maybe we're just a little lazy. Finally, I want you to look at a fact. I want you to recognize that God calls me to wear and represent His name. Now, I don't want to show you any more names of God just right now, but I want you to see if you can find the, the magic link between all of these scriptures. Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Repentance and forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. That is absolutely awesome if you stop and think about all of those and more of the scriptures. God has entrusted to us the responsibility of his name. He has put his reputation into our hands. We're called by his name. We're saved by his name. We're baptized into his name. We exist to spread his name. We gather together in his name and we're called individually by his name. That's got to make a difference. Number one, it's got to show you just how much God really does love you. 
Paul would write in Ephesians, may you have the power to understand, as all of God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love really is. One of the keys to effective prayer is realizing just how big your God is. And number two, it's got to make a difference in your the way you live. One final name for God, Jehovah Mekadesh, the God who makes holy. Paul would say, follow God's example in everything you do. Because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love for others. Following the example of Christ who loved you and gave himself as a sacrifice to take away your sins. We're God's children. We represent God's name. We're part of the family. And if you're praying for God's name to be honored, your life needs to become holy. You want to hallow the name of God, then your life needs to be hallowed just a little bit. Now you say, well, what's that mean in the real world? Well, you'll see it in your behavior when somebody cuts you off out there on the road. You'll see it in your behavior when you're at the grocery store and somebody cuts you off in the, the final checkout line and you just want to shove your cart up. You'll see it. <laughs> you'll see it when it's just you and your late night TV channels where you shouldn't be because they don't glorify it. You'll see it on the football field or the baseball field when tempers get frayed and when the call didn't go quite like you wanted to go and your team is losing, you'll see it in your language probably. Now remember, you represent the name of God. There's no greater privilege to represent the name of God. But I've talked to people who are not believers and honestly they said to me, well, if you Christians are supposed to represent the name and holiness of God, you're just not doing it very well. And that stings because I know they're right. I really do. Some Christians wear a halo on Sunday and then from Monday to Saturday, they live for the devil. And they, don't, they do more damage to the church than good. It's kind of like Gandhi said. He said, I might have become a Christian if it were not for the Christians I've met. God's reputation is on the line. Now, by the way, here's as good a place as any to make this comment. Do you see in light of everything we've said this morning how horribly, horribly blasphemous it is to use God's name as a curse word? So maybe some of us need to clean up our language a bit. Now, some of you are saying, I thought this was supposed to be a message on peace. And you're talking about living up to the holiness of God's name. That sounds like a lot of pressure on me. And I need to say, first of all, if, if your Christian life is a big source of stress to you, you're doing it wrong, okay? Because having a relationship with God is supposed to take some of the stress off. But what's wrong? What's happening? Sometimes with all of us. Why does it seem so burdensome? Well, the answer is just like that kid in Tennessee who put on a backpack that was just too heavy because he thought he could carry the whole load. You and I do that just as often. We think we can carry the stress of the world and the truth is we just need to stop and start trusting God a little more. David says, those who know your name trust in you. For you, O Lord, have never abandoned anyone who searches for you. Now, do you want to know the greatest use of the name of God? And we did this in Philippians. I don't know if you'll remember it. The greatest name of God is Jesus. Paul writes in Philippians. Therefore, God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that's above all names. That is the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and earth, and even under the earth. Do you know Jesus as Savior? If you don't, you're missing out on him so much. Can you honestly say Jesus is my Lord, my master, my boss, my CEO, that he calls the shots? 
Well, if you can't, you're missing out on a lot of things called forgiveness and peace and healing. So when you say in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name, you're just simply saying, Jesus, I want you to be number one in all my life. You're saying, Jesus, make me as holy as you are because your name is holy. A lot of things to think about today, but would you stand as we share a final song, a song of decision.